Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible and you'd like to use one, just raise your hand. We'll either let you borrow it or we'll let you keep it. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word not just in your hand, but in your life. Take this thing. Use it. Use it throughout the week. Get it beat up. It's okay. It isn't made of gold. Take the thing, write in it, and get the pages all wrinkled up. I had somebody tell me a long time ago, if your Bible isn't tore up, your life probably is. And so we are in the ninth week of a series of messages based on the book of Philippians. We're essentially in the home stretch. We just rolled over two thirds. And so I hope that this series has encouraged you to dig into and to fall in love with the book of Philippians. I mean, I mean, we're taking a long time on this book. There's so much richness in here, and to go 12 weeks on four chapters, because this series is more of what you call an exegetical study. The word exegetical just means an explanation of the text based on a careful, objective analysis. And so we've gone chapter by chapter, some uh, verse by verse, trying to learn everything that we can from this text, trying to wring it out for everything that it is, trying to absorb all of the truth, all of the beauty that's in this book, because this book, the book of Philippians, is a unique book, even unique to its author, who is a man named the Apostle Paul. Maybe you've grown up knowing him as Saint Paul. He, he literally is outside of Jesus. He's the most influential person in the history of Christianity. He wrote half of the New Testament, yet this book, even with him having written 13-esque books in the New Testament, this is super unique even to him. Uh, uh, this book is the only book where the Apostle Paul doesn't bring correction. It's the only book where he isn't trying to modify the behavior of a group of people who he is spiritually responsible for. And, and that comes out of Paul's deep love, his deep affection, his deep adoration, both for this church and for this group of people. And so today we're going to transition into the final chapter in a message that I've called Rejoice. Let's pray. God, we love you. We honor you. We appreciate you. You know, thanks for all of the goodness that you've given to us. Thanks for all of the gifts, all of the grace that you've put upon our lives. So this morning, we take a few minutes out of our schedule, and we recognize you. We worship you, as your word says, in spirit and in truth. God, my prayer is that the words on these pages will be more than just words, but they will be they'll be changed to our lives, that we would be more like you, that we would leave this place a reflection of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Chapter four in the book of Philippians, it holds, is home to some of the most quoted verses in all of the Bible. It's certainly home to some of the most quoted verses that the apostle Paul ever wrote. So let's start in verse one of chapter four. Paul says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So let's pause here just for a minute. There there are particular portions of the Bible that a lot of times even even seasoned Jesus people, we just skim over. Uh, I think about like the genealogies. The genealogies are those portions of the scripture where it says, he begat him begat, him begat, him begat, him. Half the names you can't pronounce. The other half, you can't believe a loving parent would actually call their child that. So it's natural for us to skim over those, to jump over those. And, and this is one of those verses that, that we would have a natural tendency to just kind of jump over it or just kind of skim over it. Because when you look at it, it just kind of looks almost like a personal note, if you would. It kind of looks like like a greeting that Paul would give. But verse one is so thick. It's so rich. There's so much that is contained in this. And so I'm going to take just a few minutes today and kind of go verse by verse. We're only going to cover five verses today. And so I'm going to take a little bit of time and just kind of dissect verse by verse. And verse one is a monumental passage of scripture that many of us just jump over. Here's what Paul says. He says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and who I long for. Now, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard me say this a number of times, but, but the Bible was not written in English. It was translated into English 
for us. But the Bible in the Old Testament was written in Hebrew slash Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. And, and when this passage of scripture was translated, when Paul comes and he says, therefore, my brethren, whom I love and whom I long for. The, the term long for in the Greek refers to a deep pain, pain that's caused by separation. And Paul is writing this letter, not with these people. Paul, when he wrote this book, uh, if you were here for the first uh, passage, uh, the first, I guess, p- part, first message in this series, I uh, remember that I said that uh, Paul, the apostle, wrote a number of books, and, and some of the, these books are what you'd call prison epistles. An epistle is just a book that was written by an apostle. An apostle is just someone who had a directive or an assignment from God. And so when we call Paul the apostle, it just means that he was called by God for a specific thing. Paul's thing was church planting and writing half of the New Testament. And so when Paul wrote this book, Paul was in prison. So being in prison in Rome, which was the worst prison system the world had ever known to that point, Paul, the apostle, St. Paul, writes to these people who he loves. Therefore, brothers, whom I love and whom I long for. He's He's hurt. He's desperate to be with them. And it's validating and verifying his deep love and his deep affection for these people. Like Paul loved these people. So he says, therefore, my brethren, whom I long for and whom I love. And then he builds on it. And he he uses this interesting word. He says, my joy. Here's the deal. These Jesus people, this group of church People, They were such a great source of joy that even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of turmoil for the Apostle Paul, even sitting in the most decrepit prison, and I, I wish if I had more time, I would describe Roman prisons to you, but Roman prisons were archaic. They were torture, and literally they would stack people up one upon the other, and, and they would put someone in a little cell, and dependent upon the crime that they committed, the further down they went. And so they would have just enough room, some of them, to just lay. And there would be a grate here, and they would lay on a grate, and their, their view would be the bottom of somebody who was just a little bit less of a criminal than them. And so Paul, with little light and with a heart filled with love and anxiety towards these people, he writes, you are my joy. That's, that's crazy. Then he goes on, and he says, you are my joy and my crown. And this This is the picture in the Greek of an Olympic wreath. Before there were medals, there were wreaths. And so is the picture of one of these these leaf wreaths that you would put on someone's head as a symbol of victory. And for Paul, he's saying that that these people symbolized a medal or, or an award for him. These Jesus people were a sign. They were a proof. They were validation that Paul's efforts were a success. Check this out. You're about to hear the dominant expression of this entire section of scriptures. And tons of people, I've done it, you've probably done it, hundreds of thousands of people through time have done this. They've just skimmed right past this. He says, therefore, my brothers, who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. And in the Greek, this term, stand firm, it describes a soldier faithfully standing his post. And what Paul's saying is, hold the line. Hold your position. Don't give up. Be steadfast. Be firm. Why? Because Paul knows what you know and what I know, that a life in Jesus is not always going to be easy. Living for Jesus is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. Because it's not natural. It's not natural for us to be loving. It's not natural for us to be kind. It's not natural for us to be patient. And Paul understood that. Do you know why? Because Paul was a guy, normal, human guy who struggled and strained and had difficulties in surrendering his life to Jesus. And so he says, hey, listen, people who I love and who I long for, my joy and crown, when tough times come, stand firm In the Lord, my beloved. Then check this out. Verse 2. He says, I entreat Odea and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Pause. This This is like the most interesting, unique 
somewhat baffling little stretch in all of Philippians because for three chapters, Paul's been building, 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 loving, 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 talking about how great these people are, how encouraged he is by these people, how much this church has changed the world. And then he takes this little break, this little off-ramp, if you would, and he addresses two specific people, Odea and Syntyche, prominent women in the Philippian church, women that history tells us were likely among that initial Bible study where Paul met a woman named Lydia. And if you were here for the first portion of this series, I talked about how this church began, and it's in the book of Acts, and Paul came to Philippi, a great city. And when he got to Philippi, there were not enough Jesus people for there to even be a church. So Paul goes down to the riverfront, and when he gets to the riverfront, he encounters a group of women doing a Bible study. And the great theologian, champion of the faith, Paul, begins to breathe life into these women. And one of the women, who is an Oriental CEO fashionista named Lydia, invites them back to her home, and the church at Philippi begins. These women, Odea and Syntyche, they were intimately involved in the formation of this church that Paul loved so desperately, and then, and then Paul like takes this break, this pause, and he addresses a conflict. And there's drama going on. Have you, have you ever had drama in your life? People that, you, if you've ever been to a family reunion, you've had drama in your life. If you ever went to your in-laws for Christmas, you've had a little, not me, because my in-laws are the bomb, but you, your in-laws, you had, just had to take that little side note so I didn't get another bust in the head. Uh, just, you're going to see in the lobby, just so I can just say, so I don't have to answer this question 46 more times. Sonny did not punch me in the forehead, in Jesus' name. I was trying to be a Wisconsin guy, so I borrowed a riding lawnmower yesterday. Borrowed, because I didn't want to buy one. This is something driving. And it's, I, felt, I mean, I felt like Tim the Tool Man Taylor, I mean, just that this lawnmower had no muffler. So it sounded like I was cutting my lawn with a Harley Davidson fat boy. Well, I looked back to make sure that I was cutting straight. And when I turned back around, somebody put a giant tree in the way and the branch hit me dead in the head. And man, it bled for five hours. It was ridiculous. So let me say my in-laws are the best so I don't get a matching one on the other side of my head. But if you've had family, you've had conflict, you've had drama, and Paul said, hey, listen, why are we having drama? And these two women, Odea and Syntyche, they, they've come to odds with each other. And history tells it that, that these two women, these two godly women, have somehow decided to lead rival factions within the church. And their actions were threatening. Their actions were endangering this unique and beautiful testimony that this church was enjoying with their personal offense. And so Paul, he comes back and he says, listen, I entreat you and I entreat you. And that word means I implore you. I appeal of you. I beg you, Odea, Syntyche, please, would you just agree That seems simple, but it it requires great love and great harmony, great peace and great maturity for people to believe and so uh, agree. So Paul says, listen, y'all, agree, but not with each other. I understand that you're at odds with each other and sometimes you get in conflict with people or you get at odds with people and it's difficult for you to come to an agreement with them. And so Paul says, listen, I entreat you and I entreat you to agree, not with each other, but I entreat you to agree in the Lord or with the Lord. And you say, how do I agree with the Lord? Well, here's it's easy. Love God with all your heart. Love people, even each other, even people who are different than you. Love people with all your heart. And so Paul's saying, ladies, there are some things in your life that are far more important than your human desires. Could you please not destroy what we have spent all this time building, can you please get over yourself? And can you just agree in the Lord? So in verse three, Paul takes it a step even further. He says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, pause, if you got this kind of Bible, the old school Bible, like a, like a real Bible. If you, have, if you have one of these, I want you to take a pen and I want you to circle that word companion or whatever word your translation has uh, translated that into. Now, this, 
these are becoming scarce. These with paper, these have become an endangered species. Uh, I, I just got a new Bible, got here this week. It's not on my iPhone, it's not on my iPad, it's not, it's a real Bible, old Bible. And in the margin is lines, it's called a journal Bible. And the theory is that people still know what pens are. A pen, young people, is a little tube like this, much like this. It's made of sometimes plastic. And inside is an invention called ink. And, and when, you, when you take the cap off of it, you, you can write things. And so I got this journal Bible. And, and in the lines, the concept is that I, I would, when I study my Bible, I would, I would write things and I would write notes. And so that later, when I come back, I'll, I'll understand. So, so for those of us who, who are still old school, take a pen, circle the word companion, because it's super important. It's what you would call a key word. Here's what it means. Companion paints the picture of two oxen together in a yoke. Now, in Paul's day, in fact, in, still in many countries around the world, uh, people plow their fields with oxen, and, and they put them in something called a yoke. And uh, yoke is just kind of a piece of wood, and it, it locks the two oxen together. And it's very, very important when you use an ox that the other ox you use is the same size that their shoulders are at the same proximity. Because if you use a big ox and a little ox, then your yoke is off. And when the yoke is off, it becomes impossible for you to continue to plow your field in a straight direction. So Paul is saying, uh, I, want you, I want you to come together as two oxen who are connected together because he understood that for a field to be precisely tilled or properly harvested, It required equal effort and responsibility from both oxen. See, like this was a common analogy for Paul. He he used this before. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says this. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So back to Philippians, Paul says this. Hey, listen, y'all. Help these women. These women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And and Paul is urging what he calls his fellow workers, which which refers back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, where Paul said this to start out this whole book that we've been in now for nine weeks. He said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers And the deacons, these are the fellow workers that he's talking about. So Paul is passionately imploring the people who he trained and who he left in charge. Clement and the overseers and the deacons, people that in Paul's thought, they should get this. They should understand the fact that they need to put this out before it becomes out of control. Paul knew that they understood the concept of deacons and overseers because Paul, their teacher, their mentor in In 1 Timothy, he wrote the qualifications for what an overseer or a deacon is. He he wrote to his boy, his spiritual son, Timothy, who we just saw in Philippians 1.1 was with Paul when this book was written. He he wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. You don't have to flip there. We're going to put it on the screen. Paul says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued. Pause. If you did flip over, circle that. So here's what double-tongued means. Double-tongued means you don't say one thing when you're with someone and another thing when you're not with them. Double-tongued means you don't talk about people behind their back. Let me just pause, a little (laughs) side note. If if you had a little journal Bible, you could write this in the notes. Some of y'all lay claim to being good, even though Jesus said there is no one good but the Father in heaven. And, And we claim to be good uh, you know, because we don't drink too much whiskey and we don't uh, beat our spouse or um, we don't do drugs or go to R-rated movies and, unless our Savior is being hung on the cross. We don't do none of that stuff. So we're good. 
except we love to talk about people. There's two things that are vices for Christians, food and gossip. Uh, Yet the Bible says that gossip is as witchcraft. What? (laughs) Y'all didn't even know. (laughs) Y'all didn't even know you as witches, did you? You didn't know that a bunch of kids got dressed up in a big, tall black hat with a long green nose. And when he said, ding dong, trick or treat, you said, what are you? They said, I'm a gossiper. Paul said, if you're going to be a deacon, you got to watch your mouth. You're going to be a leader. You don't get to talk about people behind their back. You, you have to be dignified. You don't, you don't get to be double-tongued. You don't get to be addicted to too much wine. You don't get to be greedy for dishonest gain. You have to hold the mystery of the faith with clear conscience and, and let, let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. 11. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So when Paul says, listen, fellow workers, help these women. He's beautifully displaying the biblical model for conflict resolution. And every one of us at some point has conflict in our life. We have somebody that we don't agree with. We have somebody that we get upset with or somebody who offends us. And yet yet Jesus came up with this beautiful concept of conflict resolution. It's in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. He says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault. Tell him between you and him alone. If he listens, then you've gained your brother. If he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge could be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So back to Philippians, apparently, for whatever reason, these two women, these two leaders, these two founders of the church, offense has gotten between them and they couldn't or they wouldn't resolve this conflict privately. So Paul comes forward and he says, hey, Clement, deacons, overseers, my fellow workers, will you please help these women who consequently their names are in the book of life? In other words, please help these women who are Jesus people to see the error and the ramifications of their ways. Because if this conflict is left unresolved, it'll destroy this beautiful church and the beautiful reflection of Jesus. And then in verse 4, we see one of those beautiful, what I call bumper sticker verses, coffee cup verses. You know, the family Christian store verses, the ones that we take and we put them on magnets and on t shirts and we put the Photoshop picture of the eagle and they that wait upon the Lord and we wear those around or we get the one that's kind of non churchy and we get like a picture of a band. And we, it's like guns and roses, appetite for destruction. And we change like one word and then we say, God and roses. People go, oh, look, I can wear a guns and roses shirt. And it's like a Christian shirt now. This is fantastic. And so this is one of those verses. And we've put it on coffee cups and bumper stickers. And it's, it's right next to the fish so that, you know, you can't cuss people out when they cut you off. And so this is one of them. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice. It's a theme. It's a, it's a concept for Paul that, that inter, interlaces throughout his writings, all through all of the books that Paul writes. But particularly in this book, Paul over and over and over again talks about the concept of rejoicing. In fact, in the book of Philippians, in every single chapter, Paul tells them and consequently us that we are supposed to rejoice. And here, coming off this great contention, this massive conflict, the Apostle Paul commands that we rejoice. He commands that we feel or show great love in the Lord. So passionate about this concept that he repeats it twice in the same breath. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. How is it? that we're supposed to rejoice? Always. Always? 
always. Rejoice in trials. Rejoice in tribulations. Rejoice in turmoil. Rejoice in tests. Rejoice in tragedy. Rejoice in the Lord. It's a super easy concept to preach, but a difficult concept to live. Can I tell you, I'm not just preaching this concept. Like you, like your friends, like your coworkers, Sonny and I have had to live this concept. Like, can I tell you that we don't wake up? That, uh, I don't have an angel butler. I don't know if you know that. Uh, my house has humanity going on in it. I got an 11-year-old. I got a nine-year-old. They go to school. They don't do their homework. They leave trash all over the house. I have a mortgage. I have bills. I have all the stuff that you have going on. I don't wake. Jesus does not wake me up out the bed. Jesus does not come. Sean, good morning, son. It's time for us to rejoice now. That would be easy, right? Like if you woke up and JC was there and you're like, I can't even be ugly in the morning if Jesus is there. There aren't angels in my kitchen talking about, you like them scrambled or you want them over easy today? We've had to live this. We have life going on. We struggle. We strain. We have trials. We have tribulations. We have to travail just like you have to travail. We, we got to take this book and we got to Hope that something comes out of this book at 5 o'clock in the morning before my kids get up out of the bed. We have had to live this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it. Rejoice. Some of you have heard remnants of this story, but in 2002, Sonny and I were forced to live this scripture. Forced to live this scripture through sickness. Forced to live it through struggles. Forced to live it in a hospital. Forced to live it through prophecy that didn't come true. Forced to live it through death. In 2002, Sonny and I had to take our little baby girl and we had to put her in the dirt. And parents aren't supposed to outlive their kids. Ever. Sonny and I a little grave just outside Seattle, Washington, and stood. Our pastor gave the, the little message. Rejoice in the Lord always. Are you kidding me? I'm supposed to rejoice now. That wasn't my proclivity. That wasn't my tendency. That wasn't my first reaction. My first reaction when we put that little girl in the ground, it wasn't to lift up my hands and say, I bring glory to your name, the first tendency for me probably wouldn't have been for you, but the first tendency, the first reaction for me was cussing and screaming and anger and desperation and despair and disdain and all the other stuff, wanting to walk away. I didn't want to get close, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh to you. I didn't want to draw nigh to nobody. I wanted to put some distance between me and the one who didn't heal my baby. Rejoice. Can I tell you? in walking this, this thing out. I've discovered firsthand the beauty of a scripture, another one that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 that says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Rejoice. That's a disconnect. It's a disconnect for you right now. It was a disconnect for me then. Rejoicing in difficulty. It seems irrational it seems unreasonable when your bank account is empty when your spouse walks out the door when the sheriff puts a padlock on your front door when your boss hands you the pink slip on the way out the door on Friday afternoon when the doctor tells you that it's terminal when the monitor goes flatline when you put the last little shovel of dirt on top of the casket how do you rejoice then how do you rejoice in those moments? Here's the good news. God tells us. He, he doesn't leave us hanging. In verse 5, he says, Let your reasonableness 
be made known to everyone. That's another circle word, reasonableness, because we don't use that word. We don't, we don't even, half of us didn't even know that was a word. It's a reasonableness. If you had tried to do that in Scrabble, there'd have been a fight at your house. You know that ain't a word. Nobody ever said, nobody has never said reasonableness ever in my family. And so when Paul says, let your reasonableness be made known, you just go, well, that's just a church word. That's a Paul word. Here's what it means. It means mercy or leniency toward the faults and the failures of others. It refers to patience without retaliation towards someone who commits or submits to injustice or mistreatment. Hmm. It sure sounds strangely like the concept of grace. The same grace that offered mercy or leniency toward you while you were committing or submitting the injustice and mistreatment toward him. The same grace, the same reasonableness that while you were still a sinner, Jesus died for you. Listen, friends, I know things are hard right now. I know things are stressful right now. I know things are heartbreaking. I know things are overwhelming. I know things are unbearable right now. But rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone because the Lord is at hand the Lord who will never leave you the Lord who will never forsake you the Lord who sticks closer than a brother the Lord who said cast all your cares upon me because I care for you Hmm. I remember in 2002 my pastor whose quotes are all over this church Fulton Buntain the doctor walked into the room with a lifeless baby and uttered these words. It's probably for the best. I never wanted to slug an old man so bad ever. It's probably for the best. Because God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And it doesn't make sense when it's right here. But when you can view your life from 30,000 feet, can I tell you that when I put that little girl in the ground, I never wanted to do ministry again. But can I tell you that the ministry that God has allowed Sonny and I to do, we never could have done before until our heart was ripped out of our chest, thrown on the ground, gathered dirt, put back in, healed and whole. I didn't want a barrier. I still wish I hadn't. But can I tell you, it gives me a compassion and it gives me a heart and it gives me a platform for things that I never could have had before. Thoughts, feelings that I never could have had before. It makes me understand the mind of God who when his son hung on the cross and spoke these words, Father, why have you forsaken me? I understand the heartbreak that went on between the father and the son. I understand the price that the father paid with his son for me and for you. When, when, you have, when you have lost the life of your child, you understand the sacrifice that giving the life of your child requires of you. So that when the father looked at your life and he said, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. I cared for you so much that I gave my only begotten son that whosoever Believe it in me, will never perish, but have everlasting life. Cast all your cares upon me. Will you cast your cares on him? Will you stand firm thus in the Lord? Will you hold your position? Will you rejoice in the Lord? Always.